I was sitting with my own therapist, Larry Lewis, spewing out my worries in a torrent of words, probably leaving a nervous sweat ring on his beautiful leather couch. You know the ones they have, the fine Freudian leather. <laughs> We're about to lose our retirement. I can't believe I made so many mistakes right before the crash. I risk too much, maybe I am bipolar. This was 2009 in the midst of the economic downturn and my wife and I had lost most of our savings and we were about to lose the rest of it. I rambled on faster and faster because I could see on the clock that the session was about to end. My job just ended, there's nothing on the horizon, I don't know what we're gonna do, and then I blurted out. And on top of all this, I'm afraid we're gonna lose our house. And with the irritating grace of the seasoned psychologist, Larry uncrossed his legs to signal the end of the session, looked at me casually in the eye and said two words, not today. Shit, I was loving my rant. And it stunned me into silence, and I, I kind of felt my brain snap into a new mode, like, like a robot short-circuiting. Like Ian Holm in Alien, where he, his head goes back and the white comes out of his... <clears throat> that didn't happen, but it was true. We wouldn't lose our house today, and in fact, we still live there. And in that moment, I understood that great insight and immediate healing can happen with short, powerful phrases. In 2010, I began my late life journey to become a psychologist. Yes, I'm a new psychologist trapped in this old body. <laughs> I even have the short cropped therapist beard, which you can get at Party City. <laughs> it's in the Imago section. That's Oh, wow, a therapy joke worked. <laughs> um, and while I credit Larry for my transition, I have to blame the son of a bitch for setting such a high standard because how will I ever be so talented to use so few words so effectively to help my own clients? I mean, I like words. I use a lot of words I already have. Um, Donald Trump said, I know words. I have the best words. <laughs> We're paid by the word. So this is the story of eight words and four people. Larry, me, and two of my former clients. It's the story of simple language and therapy and how it moves us and how it can impact our hearts and our minds. It's also about loss because one of the four people is no longer with us. The psychologist Nancy McWilliams said that her experience in her own therapy informs her about how she works with her clients. And I can relate to this because my experiences with Larry found their way into the therapy room with two of my former clients, Jean and Nina, two very different women I worked with a while ago. Jean was in her late 30s, answered phones for an architect for a living, and came to see me to work on her depression and suicidality that stemmed from severe paranoia fears that she was being eavesdropped on and followed. I first met Jean on the phone, and she sounded young and anxious with a heartbreaking hesitation to her voice. I don't know how to trust anyone, and I, I came to your clinic once, but I don't know. Jean, what would make you feel safer coming back in? Well, the people in the waiting room, they, they stared at me, and in the hallway, they turned their heads. So I thought of our alternate entrance, and I said, Gene, what if I meet you at the far, far hallway and walk with you back to my office? And something in that offer brought her back in. In our first session, I saw a nervous but alert woman with a wary smile and a sort of perseverance behind her fear. But when she sat down, her shaking hands kind of broke my heart a little bit more because it seemed like it took all of her strength just to get through each moment without falling apart. So Jean began sharing with me her fears that her TV, 
her phone, her computer, her building manager, the police, the FBI, and even I was following her, recording her, spying on her, trying to hurt her. She described a childhood of emotional abuse in which she was labeled as the bad child, the one who always did something wrong, the one who was blamed, or was left alone and ignored. Over time, we began to connect the level of Jean's general anxiety with the intensity of her fears that she was being spied on and recorded. But every week between our sessions, I would receive a long wordy phone message in which I would be fired. Hi Rich, it's Jean and I don't know if I can trust you anymore because in the middle of our session when I asked you to turn the computer monitor away from us, you hesitated and there was this blank look on your face but I interpreted that as harsh. I can no longer see you for therapy. Now, Jean and I had noticed this pattern between each session, and while I told her that I was willing to be the recipient of her fears, I also thought she might benefit from talking about it before making her final decision. So I would dutifully call her back, and using a lot of words, we would talk it out, and she would feel better, and I would be unfired. And then Jean came in one day and changed things word-wise. In a flowing session of beautiful work on her, her part, in which Jean began to connect and see that her fears kept her vigilant and isolated, I had the opening to ask, Jean, what do you think your fears do for you? She paused for a second and then just said, they protect me. Three words. Jean was as good as Larry and much better than me because it took me nine words to get the question out, at least, <laughs> and all those phone calls. And this is one of those moments where my clients continually impress me in their ability to cut to the chase of the, ins in, of the insight because those three words, they protect me, really crystallize the foundation of Jean's delusions and of the overall disorder. And I think she sensed it because when I praised her for the very first time in session, she smiled with real pride. It was the first time I saw her smile. And I was kind of giddy with excitement until the end of the session. I barely remember the rest of it. Um, I think we both felt the shift. About an hour later in group supervision, I was sharing about Jean's breakthrough and I suddenly started crying harder than I ever had about a case. I think Jean's breakthrough brought me closer to her bravery, but it was overwhelming because it also connected me to how heroic her day-to-day -day struggle was just to survive. She worked so hard just to stay here, and I was so proud of her. Nina's first line to me was, I should be dead. That's what every fucking doctor has been telling me for four years and I'm not dead yet. Can you help me with that? <laughs> well, I can't kill you if that's what you mean. <laughs> so began the banter between me and this formerly successful business person in her early 60s. Nina was literate, smart, artistic, and modern. She seemed younger than her years. We focused on her existential crisis and her exhaustion. She had beaten breast cancer only to almost immediately be afflicted with a complicated heart and lung disorder that really baffled her physicians. It sapped her energy because it restricted her oxygen intake. She lost her business, she lost her job. She had to live in her car for a while. She found some temporary housing while I treated her. This was another frail but tough person. We also focused on the grief and loss of her lively self and whether she was preparing for the end of life or to go on living in this limited state for years. Her medical condition was that much of a mystery. Nina's laugh was a New York cackle and we used a lot of words when we bantered. But sometimes she would show her vulnerability. 
which wasn't easy for her because she seemed to want to go through her journey tough and alone. It was kind of a wall up at times. Yeah, I used to have my own business in my own house and now I can't even register my own car. And she would even let a tear or two fill her eyes. She shared about her family life. A mother with serious mental health issues. A father who was abusive. A brother who, although he became wealthy, was evasive and unwilling to help her. So she grew up to be solo and self-sufficient. Over the months of work, I got to know Nina as a woman who loved dogs, hiking in the desert, understood great literature because she had been an editor and was politically astute. Our bond was a kind of twinship. And I felt, I think through her isolation, I felt compelled to try to be her one outside caring contact per week. But I wasn't sure if it was enough. The weeks went by and our connection grew. And then, I don't know how long I can do this. I mean, I'm not going to kill myself, but yesterday I couldn't get out of bed at all. And today my pulmonologist has nothing new to tell me. And for the first time, Nina began to cry openly in front of me. I stayed silent, but the power of this tough woman falling apart brought tears to my eyes. And I connected to her great pain. And in moments like that, I try to watch from a distance to gauge and control my own emotions because I don't want to be more, too much more, or too much less emotional than the client needs. She might need my strength or my empathy and attunement or all of them. But honestly, I was just trying to hold it together. Nina looked up at me. What's the use of all this fighting? If my life ended today, it would be meaningless. And without thinking, I just said, not to me. Three words. Nina relaxed and stared at me. And there was a palpable change in the room. And Two teary people sat in silence. I had done it. I'd shut my trap. I'd mimicked Larry. But more than that, I think I just helped her to feel heard and understood. And I think the simple words reached Nina's damaged heart. As we've heard before tonight, change can happen with no words, with a lot of words with the flowing connection in the room, and sometimes with just a few. I mentioned that one of the four of us didn't make it to see today. Jean went on to dig deeper in our work together until I left that clinic. Nina moved away, but I just spoke with her. We'd made an agreement to occasionally check in with each other to help alleviate her isolation. She found a better place to live and was finally awarded permanent disability. She sounds good given her circumstances. Apparently I'm, st I'm still alive. Larry Lewis died in early 2014. He'd, <laughs> he'd been my therapist for 14 years. And he helped me a lot beyond just the power of simple words. Because Larry was a great psychologist and also a very funny man, I think he'd appreciate this thought. I think that after 14 years of working with an anxious, spewing guy like me, the only way Larry could figure out how to wrap up my treatment was by dying. <laughs> oh, you did laugh. See, I didn't... Anyway, in the spirit of brevity and meaningful connection, I have five words. 
I didn't know this would be hard. I have five words to say to Jean, Nina, and especially to Larry. Thank you. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs>